All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, this is the combined efforts of Learning Works and Portland Adult Education on how to be a better virtual tutor. Um, we really are so happy to see so many people here. Um, I really miss seeing all of you in person at the building, and I'm sure Rachel and Nicole miss seeing you over at Learning Works. Um, it's really nice to see everybody. Um, wish we could all be in the same room, but this is the second best thing, so here we go. Um, today we are going to talk about um, some of the strategies um, that will be involved with remote tutoring. Um, if you could, if you could just write, um, um, if you want to, you can write your name in the chat um, and wh where you are working, Learning Works or PAE, and also if you're tutoring right now. Um, our, the overview is going to be that um, we're going to first talk about how to choose and use online platforms. Um, we've got a couple of them that we're going to focus on. There are lots out there, but we're, we're going to focus on four particular ones. Um, we are going to talk about virtual communication and teaching strategies. Then we are going to talk a little bit about supporting the needs of students during the COVID-19 crisis. And we're going to give you some resources so that um, you have the ability to do that. And then we are going to have question and answer um, for things that are going to come up. And at the end, if you are not interested in talking about being a virtual classroom assistant, um, feel free to head out after the question and answer session. I will be around to talk to people about um, what a virtual classroom assistant would entail. So please um, feel free to stay or leave if you have to go. So again, if you would like to use, tell us about yourself, your name and the organization, <coughs> and if you are actively tutoring at this time, um, this will just be helpful for us to see how many people have tutored and how many people are um, involved right now. Um, this training, again, as Nicole said, will be recorded. Um, so we, if for people who would like to see it again, you will be able to get the link and you will get some of um, the information if you missed it the first time. Um, if you have additional questions about any of the material that we are going to cover in the slides, please feel free to put your question in the chat box. One of us will be looking at the chat box to see what people are asking. We may do it at the time of the slide if it is um, relevant to that moment and we have that time, but we may wait for the end to also answer some of those questions. So please submit your questions. And if you do not get them answered by the end, please um, feel free to send either one of us an email um, to ask your question because we'd love to hear from you. Um, again, the last portion is going to cover volunteering in online group classes and the one-on-one -on -one tutors are welcome to leave at that time. Okay, um, uh, the first thing that we're going to talk about is how to choose and use your online platform. Um, the reason why we are going to talk about these particular four um, platforms that we are using is because they are video platforms. We found that um, in this time of COVID-19, when we are separated from students, that it is really helpful to see a person's face and how they are doing, and they can see your face and see how your, what your expression is and how you, you also people look at lips and look at um, how you are forming words. So we, are, we have picked four platforms that do use the video function. Um, do not be scared about this. Um, the video function is not any more difficult than the non-video function, um, and we will show you that. Um, so the four ones that we are going to be using will be, or we're gonna talk about today, will be Zoom, uh, Google Hangouts, FaceTime, and WhatsApp. A quick point about all of these platforms is that um, choosing the right one um, might come down to some really simple factors. What feels easy and comfortable for you? What feels easy and comfortable for your student? Um, what either you or your student have had some practice in before? Um, but we do find that they're all equally um, valuable and useful and rather easy to use with some practice. Um, so to take us through these platforms um, and pros, cons, and how to use them is Nicole, 
who is our volunteer manager at LearningWorks. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, so the first platform that I'm gonna go over with you is Zoom, which you have all successfully managed to use this morning. Um, so as you know, so far it is an app that can be accessed on your computer or your phone um, and it allows you to video chat with your student um, and many of you have used, utilized our chat feature as well. Um, some of the benefits of this platform, it's really good video quality. It's clear. Um, you don't get a lot of choppy words or audio. Um, there's not an account set up necessary for students. So as many of you may have done, you just accessed our call with a link. Um, so that makes it extremely easy for students to just pop right on. Um, again, so you can join through link sharing, either text or email. So if your student doesn't have a computer, you can text them the link and same thing. Um, they can click the link, it'll prompt, uh, prompt them to download the app and they, again, don't need to set up an account. And um, so Zoom does offer the chat feature as well as screen sharing, which you're viewing right now. So you can see my presentation um, that I'm sharing from my computer and um, I can still see all of your faces. So it's really um, beneficial. So a little how to on the bottom here, uh, visiting www.zoom.us to create a free account for you. And then you can schedule a meeting, which I'm gonna go through in just a moment with some screenshots. Uh, and you can make them recurring, so you don't have to create a new meeting every week. You can just do it once at the beginning. And I'll, I'll show you how to do that. Oh, sorry, or you can wait until your meeting time to invite. So you can start your own meeting and just share the link in that moment. All right, let's see. So here are some screenshots for what it looks like if you have the app. Um, to schedule a meeting, uh, the first step would be to uh, make sure that you are in the meetings tab, which you can see in this green circle at the top. And then you can click the, uh, the plus button inside this red circle. And then this um, image over here on the right side shows you what it looks like when you schedule a meeting. So you can title it, whatever topic. Um, maybe it's your, your name and your student's name. And then the date. Um, do make sure when you set up your account that you select the correct time zone. I made that mistake for some of my dance classes and it was very confusing. <laughs> um, you can generate an automatic ID. So, it's super simple and if you want to make it recurring, you can check this little box here and it'll set it up so it's the same day and time. Um, and you can set up an interval as well. So if you want it every two weeks or every three weeks, it gives you that option. All right, and then this is what it looks like when you're in your video call, um, which some of you can probably already see at the moment. Um, down on the bottom right in the red circle, you have your mute button, which turns off your mic as well as turns it on. Um, you have your stop video, so you can um, turn your video off. And if you have a picture, it might show your, um, your profile picture or it might just list your name that's on your profile. Um, your participants button will show you who's in your call and it allows you to also, if you're the host, um, you can turn off your student's mic, you can turn it on for them as well as send them a private message. Uh, you can also use the chat button in the green circle to uh, send messages to your student or receive their messages. And the green share screen button in the blue circle um, allows you to present images from your computer to your student. Um, a quick question from uh, a participant is, do you need to put in an ID? Oops. Um, the meeting ID. So mm -hmm. that is another option. If um, So usually when you send out an invitation for your meetings, you get um, a link that's, you can just click on the link and it'll take you right to the meeting or you have the option to type in the meeting ID and the password provided in that invitation. Um, so that is a little bit more of a complicated way to log in, but, um, and it's not necessary. Um, it, do, it has the same effect as clicking the link. And, and Nicole, sorry, I have another one. Um, is there a limit to the length of the Zoom meeting if you're using the free app? Um, according to my account, there's not. So I don't know if I can show you, um, no, nope, it didn't pop up. So usually when I go to schedule a meeting, there's a little note right here at the top. It's kind of small print. Um, and it says that Zoom has lifted the 40 minute limit for basic or free users uh, during the COVID pandemic. So I believe that applies to all basic and free users. Um, I did mention to Moe that you could maybe try to apply for the um, education um, you know, workaround. And there's a, we can share that link as well, actually, um, in our documents at the end. 
Um, so basically you uh, fill out this form saying that you're working for or volunteering for some kind of education organization, whether it's a school or, you know, something like PAE, and they will, um, again, lift the 40 minutes if it maybe doesn't apply to your basic account for some reason. I think that currently it's um, still lifted. There's always news coming from yeah. Zoom about how they're adapting and how they're changing. Um, but currently, I think that even with a free account, you have unlimited time. Um, I'll also say that the uh, the not requiring a meeting ID is, is totally true. You don't need that meeting ID. I think it's part of an effort to provide some more security. Uh, at the very beginning, there was an issue with kind of random people showing up in Zoom calls. I think they've done some work to um, to prevent that and monitor that. Um, but if you do want like an extra layer of security where you have to put in a specific ID, it's totally optional. Um, we did have a question just again, asking us how to do that split screen or share screen, um, kind of like what Nicole is doing right now with the slides. So she's probably just gonna um, go back to that slide that has the circles at the bottom, yeah. Yep, so this is how you share screen. If you are looking to maybe change how you're viewing your students, um, there is usually a button right up here next to this uh, full screen button. So the one on the right, this square here, makes your screen full screen, um, but then usually there's another one next to it that has a bunch of little squares in it. So that'll change how you can view your participants. And when it comes to sharing your screen, your computer or your phone will ask you, what do you wanna share? So if you want to show your student a website, you'll need to have that website um, pulled up and ready to go. If you want to show them a picture on your desktop, something that you saved, just kind of um, have what you want to share accessible. So when Nicole clicked that share screen button, her computer asked her, what do you want to share? She found the screen that had her um, Google Slides on it. So you kind of have to be a little bit ready to share your screen and be able to grab the thing you want to, to show your students. So it is that green share screen button at the bottom. Yeah, another note, I am seeing that some people um, in the chats are mentioning they've had their sessions cut short. Um, if that does happen, you can reuse the same link actually. So if you get booted off, just go back and click on that same link and it'll bring you back into your session. Um, it's kind of a strange loophole that they've left, it seems, but um, it's, it's worked for me in the past. Yeah, we had a teacher at LearningWorks do that too. So he wanted to have like a full hour long class with his group and he just had a back to back 40 and 40. Um, but again, we will share with you the information to apply to get a free account as an educational organization. We're gonna look into um, just how to put that together and, and it might be pretty accessible even for volunteers. So stay tuned. All right, let's see. So this is what it looks like um, if you're using Zoom on your phone. Uh, you can see that on the left image, it has some similar tabs. Um, you can immediately start a new meeting and then invite some people. You can join a pre-existing meeting with your um, meeting ID and password. Uh, you can schedule meetings, uh, which I believe you can see on the right side. Um, and then you can also share your screen from your phone. Um, the steps on that one are a little bit different. You do, um, I believe, have to like share your screen from the start. So it's a, a little different from the desktop version where you can share your screen once you're already in the meeting. Um, great. And then Google Hangouts is the next um, platform. So it is a Google app, which you would find. So if you go to google.com, you can find it in their menu there. Um, and it's an app that can be accessed again on the computer or on the phone that allows you to video chat. Um, it also has relatively good um, quality in terms of video and sound. Um, there's no account set up necessary on either end, I believe. Um, and then it's another simple logging on um, by sharing a link or uh, through text or email. And it does offer the chat and screen sharing options as well, and even has a function to add closed captions. Um, so like I said, you can go to this link here, hangouts.google.com, or you can go to Google and um, find it in their little menu of apps. And you select video call, you can create an invitation, and then share that invitation with your student. Uh, we do want to make a note that if uh, the student's using a phone, they do have to download the app. 
beforehand. And this is what it will look like if you're on a Google Hangouts call. It's very similar to what's, um, what's that, to Zoom. Uh, you have your mute button here and your video button here to turn off and on. Uh, this red one ends your meeting. Here is your closed captions button. Um, I believe Rachel has some experience with this where it kind of picks up who's talking and it even labels who's saying what. Yeah, it's kind of incredible as a potential English teaching tool. I've only used it um, once. I kind of discovered it by accident during like a, a Google call with friends. We said, you know, what's this closed caption? It essentially adds subtitles in real time and it will say um, who's talking. So it picks up the audio from the different computers and will create a little um, you know, English script, which I think could be really valuable, especially for students who are um, maybe struggling a little bit with reading and are you know, maybe used to listening and speaking or have more um, experience in conversation, but less um, seeing how words are spelled and laid out. So to kind of combine those things and to have something as good as watching a movie with closed captions, um, but it generates in real time, um, I think could be really awesome to teach with. So let us know if, if you end up using that. Yes, and then um, instead of a share button for Google Hangouts, we have a present now, but it does um, function the same way. And let's see, I believe in meeting details is where you can add people as well as, um, oops, my, sorry, my pictures are in the way. This button up here, or the, you see the one, and the people, you can invite new participants there. And here is your chat button. All right, let's see. WhatsApp is uh, definitely a very popular one. So this is an app that can be accessed again on a computer or a phone. Um, you cannot video chat on the desktop version, so you can't use the computer app to video chat, but you can use your phone uh, if you'd like to video chat or make phone calls. And then both the computer and the phone app can be used to send um, messages. Um, some benefits, a lot of students already use this app. It's um, an internet based app to send text so they don't have to have a cellular data service um, and they can make video calls, phone calls uh, to family in other countries that are also having access to Wi Fi. Um, again, it can be used for texting audio and video calls. So it's it kind of mashes them all together into one. Um, you do have to go through the process of downloading the app from the App Store, um, but it is free. And uh, it's really simple to create an account. You can link it to the phone number that you already have. Um, and you can add your student's contact info just like you would um, add them to your regular phone contacts. And then you can send, oh, I have some um, images here. So you can have a list of chats here, as you can see on the right. And then if you were to click on a specific um, student, uh, like if you click on your chat with your student, you can see in the top right in this green circle, the camera button to make video calls and the phone button to make phone calls. And you can I also... stop you there for a second. Oh, yeah. um, so just to, to have you think about this for a second for WhatsApp, um, because so many students have that as Rachel, sorry, as Nicole said, um, this might be a good thing to start with if you are thinking that my student is such a low level and is not going to understand some of, is not savvy in technology and is not going to be able to understand some of the instructions that I might have to give, it might be the thing to start with and then move on for, to something else because so many of the students are familiar with this. And actually in the low level English classes at PAE, some of the teachers are using WhatsApp for their whole class. So they just basically text back and forth to their students. Um, they, she sends audio messages and she sends some video messages. Um, so you can do both of those. Like you can, you can just uh, tell your student, I'm going to tell you a little story, then send it to them and then ask them some questions about it. So I just want to make sure that people know that this is the app that you might want to start with a very low level student. We had another question, um, and this might be a good opportunity for either Nicole or, or I, um, I can do it to actually using a phone, uh, showing how to add a contact on WhatsApp. Um, it's, there's a few steps and I don't know, Nicole, if you wanted to do that, I also can. Uh, yeah, I can pull it up really quick. Let me see. 
So you'll have to download the, the app first. So once you have the app, um, actually you can see this here on my screen right here. If you click on this little button here, uh, kind of like you're gonna write a new message, it'll bring you to this screen here. I don't know if you all can see very well. But then let's see, the second blue button, so not the top one, but the second one says new contact. So if you click on new contact here, it'll bring you, you to able, build. Sorry to interrupt, would you be able to not share the screen and then we can see? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. All right, great. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. So like I said, once you, this little blue square up in the corner here, we click on this and it brings you to the screen here. So again, we're gonna click the second blue button that says new contact. If you have more than one student in a class, you can create a group and you can uh, group video chat with up to eight people. Um, I don't know how many people you generally have in a group. So we could do new contact for a single person and it brings you here so you can add your, their first name, their last name and um, their phone number. And then once you hit save, it should pop up directly to their um, to your chat with them so you can send them a message immediately. And what it also will do is let you know if they already have a WhatsApp account, which we found most students do. So when you put in their number, it'll give you a little checkbox like, yes, this student already has WhatsApp. Um, and that'll make it even easier to just immediately start chatting with them um, because they'll, they'll have the app and they'll know how to use it. And it does also kind of give you some um, feedback as to whether or not your student has received the message or if, even if they've opened it. Um, so once you send a message, you can see here on the left um, and on the right. So one gray check, I believe, means that your message went out, but it wasn't received by another phone. Yeah. Um, once, you, once their student's phone has received it, you should get a second gray check, and then they'll both turn blue once they've mm -hmm. opened your message. Um, and Nicole, the, someone also asked, can you have group meetings on WhatsApp? Yes, you can. So you can have group chats, um, similar to adding a singular contact. If you do that same process, press the group, uh, actually, new group right here. So you can mm -hmm. add a whole group of contacts, and then you can um, have a group chat. So you can send messages to multiple people at once, and you can even have a group um, video chat. So you can, um, I think it, I said up to eight people now. It was limited to three or four, but they've um, increased it, I think, because people have been a little desperate. <laughs> All right, so the, I think this is the last one, uh, FaceTime, which if you have an iPhone is already installed um, and it's an app that can be only accessed on an iPhone or a Mac computer uh, that allows for video chat. Um, it's easy to use. Again, there's no account set up necessary and we do have a lot of students who have Apple iPhones um, or products. And there's two ways to use it. So um, if you, um, have your students' contact info. You can open the FaceTime app, um, this button here, and you can press the, there's a plus sign. Did I take screenshots of this one? No. There's a plus sign in the top right corner and you can um, search by your student's name and then select that name and it'll start a call. Or um, you can go directly to your contacts and search for your student's name. And if you um, click on that contact on their name, um, you can start a FaceTime here. Let me see if I can do it. We'll stop the share again. We'll do a little demonstration. So mine appears down here on the bottom. This is just where I've placed mine for ease. Um, so I can go directly to the app. And then in the top right corner up here, we got the plus sign. So when you click on the plus sign, I can search by names. So I'll search for Rachel. So once her name pops up at the top there, it turns blue. So if it doesn't turn blue, that means that they don't have an Apple product. They probably have some kind of other smartphone, um, but you can click on the name and then it'll offer if you want to do um, an audio only so they won't be able to see your face or you can do one with video. So it'll be like a normal video chat. And the other way we offered was going through your contacts. So again, my contacts is on my homepage, but this is what it looks like here. We click there and I will search again for Rachel. And once I click on her contact, it brings me this screen. And you can click on the little video or you can even phone call or send them a text. Or if you have their email saved, you can send them an email. So that one gives you lots of options. Do you have any questions about that one? Great, okay. I 
think that's all I have for our various platforms. Awesome. And if you guys do think of a question that occurs to you later about Zoom or WhatsApp or Google, um, just throw it in the chat and we will, um, we will get to it. Uh, fantastic. Um, okay. Virtual communication and teaching strategies. Um, Molly, was this you or me? That was you. It was me. Okay. Um, so when it comes to actually doing the communication with your student, um, we know it can be challenging. It's, it's challenging to take something that is in person, uh, usually pretty like organic and something you can use a lot of intuition and just make it this sort of more abstract, intangible thing. So how do you approach that? Um, the first thing you do, and especially if you've yet to implement this online video training, um, or maybe if you're just getting started and having some issues, is doing what we call kind of like a discovery period. So asking yourself if you know your student rather well, or asking your student um, some of these questions. Uh, do you have prior experience with one of these apps? Do you have WhatsApp? Do you use WhatsApp? Tell me about uh, Zoom. Do you know this word? Do you know this, this app? Um, have you used it for your class at Portland Adult Ed or a class that you've taken elsewhere? Um, knowing your students' literacy skills is really helpful because a lot of this um, strategy about, you know, click here and this button and this word, if they're not really um, that literate, then it might be something that uh, might need to be explained to them orally. So think about their, their literacy skills as it relates to being able to use uh, some of these apps. Um, you know, personally, if you know your student is the kind of person who uses a phone or a computer a lot, um, that might make them more likely to adapt to um, a new technology routine or platform. Um, and I'm sure some of you know, you know, does your student respond to texts immediately or is it just days and days? You know, how communicative with, with technology is your student already? Um, and also this is an important part, even if the answer to all of these questions at the beginning is no, if you ask your student, do you want to learn more? Do you want to become better? with a computer, with your phone. I bet a lot of students, even ones that are low level or maybe a bit older, um, they will say yes. I, I taught a class at PAE for um, a year that was very low level students and we had computer days and even some of the students who had never used a computer before really liked learning and liked the chance to get to maybe have some new skills. Um, so your student might say yes, like I want to learn more and I want to be better at um, using a computer. Um, which kind of brings us to, um, on a more broad scale, you know, what this moment means. Um, so in particular for PAE, what might that mean? Oh, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to let people know that um, if you plan to tutor in the fall, um, right now we are hoping, uh, PAE is hoping to have kind of a technology week where we are going to be helping students get on certain devices and get on certain platforms. So we're hoping that we will have like the week before class starts, we are gonna have some instructional time with students to help them get on these platforms. So we're, that's, that's the hope, we haven't finalized that yet, um, but that is what we're planning right now. And for the world outside of Portland Adult Ed, um, in general, I think during this time of, you know, restrictions and shutdowns, it's, it's sort of easy to think about all the, the bad and negative things that are happening. But actually, um, what we're hoping as teachers uh, happens is that there will be an overall increased digital literacy that will come out of this, um, even for, for, you know, non-students. I mean, all of us logged into this Zoom call today as part of a, you know, normal um, use now of, of computers and technology. So if students get some increased digital literacy out of this, it will be um, better set up to succeed in um, learning environments, uh, various jobs, the workplace. So I think that hopefully um, this is a really nice opportunity to help students get to that, um, that place. Um, and I do see a question uh, that kind of goes back to WhatsApp. I will note it and save it for the uh, Q&A. 
Okay. So um, how to practice using online platforms. Um, in the middle of uh, March, when we found out that we were not going to have PAE classes in person anymore, I had to do a lot of <laughs> quickly figuring out technology. And um, it was definitely scary. So I, if any of you are overwhelmed by this technology, you know, we've all been there. Um, it is, however, um, I must say now, I feel very comfortable with the platform that I'm using and I'm, and it didn't take very long. So, but one of the things that I think everyone will need to do if you haven't been practicing the online platforms yet with anybody is to practice with someone. So I would practice with my co-teacher in citizenship, Mary Bloom. We would send a Zoom invitation to each other. Did you get the link? Did it work? Um, then we got on the platform. How do you share the screen? How do you send a chat? Um, so before you kind of work with a student, it might be a good idea for you to practice with a family member, a child. Usually the teenagers, the 20 year olds are very good at this. Um, have them practice with you. Um, and then practice with your students. So practice sending and opening the links. Say, I'm going to send you something. Click on the blue link. Um, so that they are practicing getting on the platform with you. Um, encourage the students, if they have children or other members of the family who are savvy in technology, ask them to get help from people at home or their roommates who may be good at that. Um, practice muting and unmuting the video. That's very important because if they can't hear you and you can't hear them, that's a real problem. So make sure you talk about the terms. What does muting mean? What does unmuting mean? What does video on mean? What does video off mean? Um, so talk about that vocabulary um, before. And I have also done a lot of things as far as um, in our class, We the first couple days of class, we just kind of went over the Zoom functions. We, we, took, we wrote, dropped, drew pictures of the microphone, the video, um, the chat function, and we hold, held it up and we said, this is the chat. This is how you send um, a note to us. Um, so you can, you can do that for a couple of days and just practice these features. It really helps. Um, encourage the student to explore and play with the features and the buttons. Um, you can do a thumbs up, you can do a clapping hands, you can do a lot of different other things um, to get the attention of the teacher. Um, and also, if you feel like um, your student might be having some hearing difficulties, we have found that if you use the headphones, um, that that can really help the sound quality for both you and for the student. So you can try to um, practice with the headphones too to see if that makes the experience a little bit better. Do we have any questions about any of that? Uh, let's see. I think that we have some questions, again, with some tech things, but I'm noting them for the Q&A. Okay, great. Moe, did you have your signs that have oh, the yes, I do. on them? I do have my sign. Here we go. Um, so if you can see, does everybody see? Um, on the phone, for example, um, if you're doing Zoom on the phone, um, this is the, the, the dots that get you to the chat function. So that's one of the things that I hold up to my students to say, if you're doing Zoom on the cell phone, you've got to go to these dots. And then if you go there, you will find the chat. Here's the chat. This is where you write it. Okay, so we would do this a lot in class to, to explain to them, you know, where, um, where everything was. We would also hold up the the video, stop your video if you don't want to be seen, start your video if you do want to be seen, and also mute, okay? Um, this is where you mute your microphone. This is the microphone. You, you know, hold, it up, hold it up a little bit more. Yeah. All right. You see it now? Yeah. Okay. So just drawing pictures, just you could, if you have a whiteboard at home, you can use a whiteboard, um, but it really helps to draw the pictures, make it big so the student can see it and tell them the colors that they are and all that. So um, to that, I will also add that I have found the universal symbol for I can't hear you is a pointing to the ear, shaking your head and like looking kind of just like stricken and you know just like showing like hearing no and like eventually especially if you also have like a picture of a microphone 
the meaning becomes clear. Um, I will say that uh, also terms to teach in addition to mute and video is chat. Most students have just gotten a handle on like text as the, the word that we use to send messages, but chat might be new. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later about how to um, you know, teach the language of these meetings um, to, to make them a little, go a little smoother. Um, but we also want to get into the actual English skills that you as tutors are all um, you know, practiced in and, and want to help your students uh, progress in and how they might uh, show up and be best used in this uh, video uh, platform world. Um, so we've split it up into speaking and listening and also reading and writing. Uh, speaking and listening is um, kind of, you know, the most intuitive for using video. The minute you see your student's face, there will be speaking and listening. So if your student has identified conversation or speaking as one of their goals, luckily we find that the video is, is conducive to that. Um, so you might do some of the same things you would do in a regular lesson, basic conversational questions, um, and just a good teaching practice is to flip roles. So you ask, the student answers, and then you tell the student, ask me. It's a great way to just sort of flip the dynamic and get the student used to starting conversations or asking questions. So review the question words, use the kind of everyday prompts that you might already be using, you know, going over the date, the day, the time, the weather, um, what did you do today, how do you feel? I mean, this is kind of level one, level two, level three, like really um, foundational uh, English lesson subject matter. Um, dictation works really well on video. It almost, you know, having a little bit more of a challenge with the video makes a student listen a little harder. Um, so you can give dictation anything from one letter or number at a time for a low level student um, or, you know, vocabulary words or whole sentences um, and having the student uh, much like we've been doing in this, um, kind of show you what they've written. Um, or if they're a little bit higher level, maybe using the chat box to type in what they're hearing you dictate. Um, pronunciation, for anybody who went to our pronunciation training uh, last semester, I think it was, um, you know, this is a speaking skill. So doing things like games and, and you know, copying and, and songs and rhythm, all of that are speaking tasks that you can do on a video call. Um, if you're interested in um, learning more about pronunciation skills and how to practice them, let us know. Uh, we took pretty diligent notes at that uh, pronunciation training and we can uh, forward, forward the, them to you if you're interested. Uh, build vocabulary. Um, as you're speaking, take a moment to write down something that you say. Um, having something to write on immediately, whether that's a piece of paper or a whiteboard. Um, there's an, we have a little instructional video on how to make a whiteboard at home. Um, if you can use something that's like easy to see and you're talking and you say a word and then you can immediately write it. Like there's something really um, useful and immediate about having something to write on. So um, use that in your speaking lessons. Um, and if you go back to the high level ones, um, basically one of the bigger distinctions about speaking to a student on a video call is that for a low level student, you want to go slow, expressive, and repetitive even more so than in person. So the slower and and more clear, sometimes even more expressive, using your hands, using your face, whatever can help you come out on that video screen a little clearer will be helpful. Um, for high level students, same tasks, but just more complex, longer, um, recounting longer events, doing more with verbs, um, using idioms, not just simple vocabulary, but um, encouraging them to learn kind of the way we speak colloquially. Um, yeah, kind of leveling up with the same, the same kinds of tasks. Um, so a lot of people have asked, um, you know, speaking and listening is one thing, what about reading and writing? Um, so reading and writing can be a little less intuitive, but there are ways to do it with video calls. Um, giving short, simple journal prompts, even telling your student, okay, can you write a sentence with, you know, either starting the sentence for them, you know, having a topic, having them write it and show you. Um, 
there's also a way to, one way to do that is to have students send you pictures of what they've written. Um, we've got some examples of that in the next slide, but um, we'll get to that. Um, so again, using the chat function, texting or email to practice writing, um, doing spelling tests, it's sort of a form of dictation, but most students love spelling tests. It's just one of the things they love the most. And luckily it's kind of easy to do on a video call. You know, number one, are you ready? It's, it's fantastic. Um, and uh, reading short passages, uh, the best way to do that is either using the screen share function um, or taking a picture of a story and texting it or, or WhatsApping it to your student. Um, just having something in front of them that you can both read together. Um, again, high level, same things, but um, more complexity and longer and maybe higher level students would have an easier time using screen share um, and following along. And on the next slide, I do have a couple examples of uh, real students from PAE who um, use technology to send writing to their teacher. The one on the left is a student who during a FaceTime call with her teacher, um, all she did was flip the phone around and show her teacher her writing based on a prompt her teacher had given her. And it was great because they could talk about the mistakes, uh, the student could read it out loud for the teacher, kind of the things you would do in person. Um, the second one is longer, so it was just a photo that um, the student took and texted it to his teacher, then they had a phone call about it. Um, most students can get a handle on the sending and receiving of pictures, so that's sort of a good workaround for, for reading and writing strategies. Um, Awesome, and we've got some great comments about people who use the whiteboard function in Zoom. Um, we can get into that a little bit more in the Q&A, but that is an option, um, something that you can write on so your student can see it. Uh, likewise, a blank Google Doc or a blank Word document that you share is something that you can use um, in real time. Um, so those are kind of like the, the ESL skills to, to incorporate into video. Um, but we also have some general communication tips. What are some things we're seeing, um, ways to improve just the smoothness and clarity of talking on a video call. Um, someone asked in the comments, are students using phones, computers? I'm seeing kind of a breakdown where a lot of tutors are using desktop computers or, lap, or um, laptops or iPads and a lot of students are using cell phones. So, that's you know really no problem, but just keep in mind your student might not have um, you know the exact same setup as you. So anyone using a phone should try propping it up just on a couple of books um, so that they can kind of treat it like a computer and have the chance to talk and use their hands a bit more naturally. What you want to avoid is something I'm sure you've seen before, which is the awkward angle of a student um, and maybe just their nostrils or possibly, you know, a, a strange part in their house or something. And, you know, it's funny, yet yeah, Mo's doing it. Um, you know, sometimes my, my mom and dad will, will do that as well. But um, if you can get them to correct it, uh, just like Moe said earlier, the point of the video is to see the face, to see the mouth and the expressions, get your student to prop it up so you can actually communicate a little more um, a little more smoothly. Um, most video platforms have the option to hide the self view. Um, we can always go into you know where on each platform to find that, um, but there is a way if you kind of play around and find the option so that you don't see yourself. It can be distracting to have a mirror of yourself while you're trying to just focus on communicating. So if you prefer to hide yourself, that might just make it feel a little easier to talk, you know, naturally. Um, Moe already mentioned using headphones, especially if students are at home with other people or if you're at home with other people, um, kind of not only improving audio, but just making it feel a little more private. So you don't, um, they don't have their English lesson broadcast for everyone. Um, again, a whiteboard or notebook, something to write or draw on that's immediately accessible is great for you and the student to have. Um, and speaking loudly and clearly are important no matter what the level is of the student. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah. Um, 
And now um, we're just going to talk a little bit about um, supporting the needs of the students during COVID-19. Um, we have found that um, since March, um, people who are, are working as conversation partners with students um, tutoring um, remotely have heard um, more information, personal information, um, than they might reg regularly have heard if they were working with them um, at PAE or at Learning Works. Um, it's a more personal space. You're talking to a student um, in their, you know, in their home and you're, you're at your home and it tends to kind of offer more personal um, information. So um, one thing I wanted to talk about is just that um, you are still a tutor for an academic. This is, you're, you're an academic tutor. That is your job. You are, you are not supposed to be the social worker in this situation. Um, but it is also true that because of what is happening out there, many of our students are struggling and they're, they're in crisis. Um, so you may hear about that. Um, and so what I wanted to let you know is that there are lots of resources for helping people. Um, that is not your job to, you know, guide your student in the, you know, helping them in that, but you can guide them in this to helping them find the resources where the numbers and the, the contact information. Um, we have a social worker at Portland Adult Ed who ha we could refer um, students to, but they will be leaving at, in mid-June. So after that, over the summer, um, it really is going to be a matter of guiding your student to the right contact place. Um, so we're going to give you some information about where to go. Um, you might hear that your student's concerned with the rental assistance. We've heard about how sometimes the landlords are saying that you have one more month and then you have to get out. Um, we're hearing about food insecurity. Um, obviously, health care and mental health are a big issue at this time. Um, some people need to figure out how to apply for unemployment. Um, so they, they need um, answers where to go for that. Um, and then also there's always the child care and children's needs um, option. I do want to let people know there is plenty of food out in the Portland community. So if the student has food insecurity, there are many places that are um, providing food. So that should not be an issue. Um, the other things are probably a big issues. Um, so you've got to um, listen to your students, but also say, okay, uh, this is not my um, this is not my job as far as I don't have the um, specialty, I don't have the professional um, know-how to help you with this, I will send you to this particular resource so that you can follow up there. So what can you do? Um, Portland, um, multilingual, Portland has a multilingual COVID-19 resource page um, that has translations. Um, so we found that they are, it's a very good resource and it gets updated constantly. Um, if you find out that your student has got an urgent need that is really needs to be taken care of today at this moment, the best thing to do is to call 211. They also have translators there. Um, there is a series of steps you have to go through to get a translator, but that is the best place to go if you feel like your student needs help immediately. Um, if you know that um, the student is, um, you, you don't know where to send the student um, and you would like some help and any time and you don't feel comfortable sending them to the Portland of Opportunity COVID-19 resources or you don't feel comfortable sending them to 211, um, you can contact either Rachel or me, um, send us an email and we can find out where to send that student and we can take care of that. So. Um, if you, basically there are three things to do is to send them um, to the resources. Um, here are three of them. Um, one of the places that you can go is the PAE eboard. Um, and that is um, a website where the students can get um, not only ESOL help or, and practice that the teachers have put on there, but it's also a place where they can get help with resources. So you can check the PAE board. You can look at the Maine Equal Justice Partners website. They also have that and this City of Portland Multilingual COVID-19 Guide. And those links are in there. So um, as I said before, if you hear that a student needs some help, 
and it's urgent, the first thing you're going to do is tell them to call 211, okay? Um, if it is non-urgent and you feel comfortable, you can give them the contact information, the phone number of the different agencies and the different resources. If you don't know how to help that student, um, call or email um, me or Rachel or Nicole. Okay. We have some other resources, um, so not just, um, you know, the, the basic needs resources you might end up uh, needing or referring to regarding COVID-19, but um, some of our tried and true resources that we refer um, our tutors a lot to at LearningWorks. Um, and we will send all of you guys uh, a document full of links and uh, you know ways to access these materials. Um, if you are tutoring high level students, um, especially with speaking and conversation, a conversational um, sort of alphabet of phrases and idioms, A to Z, is one of my most referred to materials. Um, it could provide endless fodder for video calls, is going down the letter of the alphabet and finding a new idiom each time. Uh, Newzella or News ELA um, is one that I've heard Moe talk a lot about. It's basically the news, but pared down and simplified for English language learners. Um, and there's a lot going on in the news right now, so it might be a good way to um, read about current events, talk about current events at a more accessible level. Um, if you are tutoring a low-level student um, and you're looking for things, especially short things to read, um, the Marshall Adult Ed and Bow Valley College um, organizations both have really easy short passages, just lists and lists and lists of them, and they're kind of fun to choose from. Again, could provide really great um, foundation for a reading lesson on uh, the video platform. Um, in general, we also have a quick video that we've made to show people how to make a few things at home that might aid you in lessons, including making a whiteboard, um, making sentence makers that students can rearrange or that you can rearrange to show them how to make a sentence. Um, so we'll include that. Um, the New Jersey Literacy Council also has um, some really great distance learning resources, including recordings that teachers have made of their classes with their students, um, which is a nice way to see how some instructors are using Zoom, even with low level students. It's really helpful to see how other people are doing it. Um, and again, all of the resources that Moe just mentioned will include for the, the COVID-19 section as well. Um, Alrighty, that's all we've got in terms of the um, prepared slides. So I think we're going to go into the question and answer period. We had a lot of great questions submitted that we can um, address now. And we can also address some questions that came up uh, during the chat that I've written down. Moe, do you feel one or the other should be first? Why don't we do the chat ones first and then we'll, yeah. Sure, so one question we had is that a person was using WhatsApp video chat with their student and they wanted to kind of toggle back and forth between the video and the texting or the, the chat function and her student couldn't find the text or couldn't see the text or chat. Um, I don't know if Nicole, you've had experience with that or um, you know, using the video function but then needing to go to. I have not. I, I've done that. So um, I've been tutoring a student on WhatsApp and it is, um, you have to press an arrow to get back to the chat function or the message function. Um, and it is, it's difficult, but I, I think you can do it. You just have to keep talking to them about you know, if you could do any kind of an illustration about like when we're on the video function, go back to the message function. Um, and this is, you know, I wrote something to you in the text. And then, so the student knows, oh, I've got to go back to the, the text function. So it is, you can't do it at the same time. Like you have to go back and forth. Um, it, it's another, it's one, one of those things that you just do have to practice. Um, it, there's not some, some key magic um, solution to that. I think you're just going to have to keep practicing with the student. Um, and, and it is, um, I think that I'm, I'm working with a student that's an ESOL one and she has figured it out. Um, so I think it just takes a little bit of practice. That's a good point in general. Sometimes you might need to 
carve out a little time specifically to practice. So maybe assuming that, you know, the lesson might come, you know, a little bit later or that you might need like 10 or 15 minutes just to practice and even teaching that terminology, like go back, video, go back, text, like doing it until it feels a little bit like a drill. And then that way, if you have that time to practice, the next time it comes up, in your lesson, you can say, go back. And then because of the drill and the practice that Moe mentioned, it might become a little easier. Also, arrow. Arrow is a good word to teach. Um, there's a lot of words that I think we don't even think about because we're just, they're embedded in how we teach and how we use technology. Um, but teaching things like, you know, prepositions again, like top of the screen, bottom of the screen, point, click, you know, the verbs that you use and the, the words you use to orient students, that might be a whole lesson, um, you know, going back or, or you know, delete or refresh or, you know, anything that we, that we kind of are, are used to saying. Um, we also had another just general question about screen sharing. I think that screen sharing is a popular yet mysterious topic for a lot of people. So um, possibly, Nicole, if you could go back to the slide um, with the maybe Zoom and I, great. So tell us again, you've got this up and you're using Zoom. How do you, how do you get a slide on the, the screen? Yeah, so the first thing um, before you share your screen, you want to make sure that you have um, whatever you're gonna share open on your computer um, so that when you click this green button here, you'll get a little window that pops up. Um, and it'll give you an option of things that you have open on your computer that you're able to share on Zoom. Um, so you can share your desktop and then anything that you open on your computer will share um, through, your, through Zoom or you can select a specific um, item. So I selected the, um, my window for Google Slides specifically so that anything else that popped up in the way um, won't, won't be shared with you guys. So if, if you're interested in using slideshows with students, which can be a really great teaching tool, um, you'll need to just know where is your slideshow? Is it on your desktop? Did you do it on Google? Is it on the internet? Like have it ready to go. And then as soon as you select it, you go from screen share, you select material, your student will see those slides. Um, and again, it might take a little practice. Can you see this? Do you see it? Um, but that's how you do it on Zoom. And what is the terminology for doing it on Google? On Google um, okay. Hangout? On Google, it said present now. Present now. Okay, so slightly different, same basic thing. It'll ask you, what thing do you want to present? Is it on your internet? Is it a file? Um, someone also just asked, could you select a Google Doc? Yes, have your Google Doc ready to go. Your student will be able to see that screen and then you could write together live or maybe do some real-time corrections um, and I think that's a really great use of the screen sharing it's almost like having a, a sort of a whiteboard um, and on that note where is the whiteboard function on zoom um, I'm not sure because I haven't used it if you go back, I can show um, back to the Zoom thing. Okay, so when you go, when you do your sharing of screen in the in Zoom, then it will pop up and at the top, there will be a function for the whiteboard at the top. So we can't see it here, but when you press the, the blue share screen, at the top of that, after you share your screen, there will be a whiteboard function. And then you can just press the whiteboard and then you can use a marker, you can do arrows, you can do anything and text or drawing and anything. So it's kind of a neat little um, device. The only problem with the whiteboard is that um, you have to like, um, sometimes it's kind of funky as far as where your um, margins are and all of that. So that's why a lot of people say it's much easier to just use a Google Doc and write on the Google Doc. So you can do either one, but some people are saying if you really wanna do a lot of writing that you would wanna do it on the Google Doc. 
Nicole, could you um, find that whiteboard? Could you just like show us what the whiteboard function looks like? Oh, in the meantime, while she's doing that, just wanted to let people know, if you do have a student that's having a really lot of trouble, like the WhatsApp student that's having trouble finding the text part, um, we do have volunteers right now who speak several different languages who are calling students in their free time with tech questions. So if you would like to refer some, a student to that service that we have right now, they probably are gonna end in the end of June. But if you have somebody that you really wanna to get to talk to somebody about tech right now, you can send me an email and send me their name and I can refer it to the tech specialists there. I still do not have the whiteboard option. Even when you press share screen? Yeah. Because my only options at the top are basic, advanced, and files. Okay, so it might be, a, it's probably the teacher function or something. But, oh, cool. Yeah, um, it might be the way that I have my account set up. Yeah. So yeah. In that case, a Google Doc would be good, or I think even a Word Doc, um, just like something blank that you share, and then when you write on it, uh, your, student, your student sees it. Um, Moe, would that opportunity to, to use the help of a like multilingual tech person be available to Learning Works volunteers as well? Sure, sure. Awesome. Great, so if you are tutoring with Learning Works and you feel like your student is best helped by just talking to somebody in their own language about all of these things, um, let me know and we can connect you with one of those people as well. Um, so, I think that was one of our, la we had a question about online classes at PAE, but I think you answered that. Yeah, and, I, and somebody also had a question about, um, does every student have access to the internet? And is that a statewide thing? Um, and I don't think that's the, a statewide thing because it's, um, some of the counties in Northern Maine, I'm sure do not have access, but, um, in Portland, all students in Portland public schools should are that they've kind of made a, a promise that everyone should have that internet access. So that includes Portland adult ed students. And so if you find out that a student of yours does not have a phone and cannot in, and can, or does not have a computer and cannot access the internet, then PAE or Portland Public Schools will provide a device, a, hot, a hotspot. They will even provide a cell phone or a um, laptop to help students get on that. Um, so if you feel like you need to talk to someone about getting tech, some kind of device for your student, you can contact me. Awesome. Um, we're now going to look at the questions that some tutors uh, submitted ahead of time and kind of go through those. Um, if the information is kind of repetitive, we'll, we'll skip that. But uh, the first question we got was one about having an older student who had a lot of trouble uh, navigating the internet and using Google Classroom and that they spent a lot of time in their sessions kind of struggling with these things and how to kind of maximize their time a little bit better. Um, as we kind of went through any of those like practice activities, ways to practice using technology, including the drawings, the, the drills, that would be great. Um, finding out if they have someone at home who could maybe hop on and, and join a session um, using the help of the multilingual tech assistants at Portland Adult Ed who are available through the end of June. Um, and just again, teaching as many terms as possible for, for how to find things. So things like screen and, and above and below and click. Um, and one thing we're telling our tutors at Learning Works is that the goals for students at this time might be need, uh, they might need to be modified a little bit. So rather than making leaps in language progress, a goal might become, you know, logging on to Google Classroom or, you know, being able to join a video call at the correct time. So I think making goals a little smaller and more accessible when it comes to tech is totally fine for this time and just kind of scaling down um, the expectations a little bit. Um, Moe, I don't know if you want to answer this one, but what might be the most effective, one of the, some of the most effective ways to kick off a new 
tutoring relationship was another question we got. Yeah. Um, so that's a good question. Um, it's especially kind of strange to call a student that you've never met and just start talking to them. Um, so there are two ways I think to do that. Um, if you are, um, if you are going to be working with a PAE student and that student has a teacher, probably the best way would be to have this, the teacher introduce. You can do that on WhatsApp. You can do a three-way WhatsApp um, call or text um, in group. And so they can introduce you to that student. Um, it, the next thing is if it's just kind of a cold call and you're not being introduced by a teacher, um, you know, just start with the very basics, you know, um, what's your name, have them ask you questions, of, you know, where do you live, um, where are you from, where were you born, um, have them ask you the same questions, um, you know, repeat after me, where, where were you born, and um, so just kind of get those familiar, you know, what's your favorite color, or what food do you like, um, just those very um, basic um, questions. Sometimes the family questions can get a little bit personal just because many of our students have had some trauma with their background. So maybe not going right to like, do you have children? You know, do you have parents and that kind of thing, but just going on to the more basic, um, you know, everyday type of that. What's your job? Are you working? That kind of thing. But um, yeah, it's, it's a tough thing to call somebody cold, but um, I think if you just use your conversational skills and have some preparation of what kinds of questions you, you could ask, I think that will be fine. Yeah, and if you are a little brave with the screen sharing, you might use that to show pictures of you know, things in your life or maps from where you are, the sort of things that would be easier to look at if you were in person, um, you might find a way to, to show them on the screen. Um, teaching the word show and the phrase show me is a great teaching tool. So that might come up a lot in video, like show me your paper, show me a picture, show me your sentence. Um, another thing I'll say is that we're in this strange scenario right now. Even right now, we're seeing everybody's like homes and their kind of intimate spaces. Um, so you can take advantage of that when you meet your student. They might have their kids just like in the next room. They could introduce you. You know, if you have pets or want to show them like, you know, your your what's on your wall. Like it's it's um, kind of a a sweet opportunity to like be able to see and know a little bit more about each other when you do the video call. Oops, chat just left. Um, we also have um, a question about um, how to schedule um, tutoring sessions. Like, should you keep, um, you know, a certain, a certain time every week? If a student is used to meeting their tutor after a class, should you keep that time? Um, I think the, the answer is yes. I mean, trying to hang on to routines and structure is really helpful in this time when a lot of routines and structure have like, you know, gone out the window. So if you can treat your virtual session like it's an in-person session with the date and the time um, and the expectation that it will recur, I think that that's, um, that's great. Um, there is a few more questions. Um, we had a question about tutors having access to teaching materials that um, the teachers at PAE are using. Uh, Moe said that there are a lot of things available online through PAE. Some of them include textbook materials. So if you are tutoring a student from adult ed, uh, talk to Moe. Uh, she also suggested sending pictures of a textbook back and forth. So again, taking a picture with your phone of a page in a textbook um, is really helpful just to see, you know, what kind of activities are they doing? Where are they in terms of content or grammar? Um, so use that text picture function um, uh, as best you can. Um, I think that some of the other questions may have been uh, answered but when we went into things like screen sharing and um, using Google Docs or a Word document or a whiteboard to write in real time. Um, I, there is another question asking about any useful tips, ideas, or activities that others have found to be successful or helpful. I think some of the tutors have been sharing those in the chat, which is awesome. We can save that text and, um, and also forward it to everybody. Um, and let's see, 
someone height um, for Rachel, someone asked, is it valuable for a higher level student to read aloud? Yes, I think that reading aloud is, um, I mean, it's a language skill that can be emphasized at any level. I also think that it, it tends to come up more with lower levels because you're trying to get a student to start to link all those areas. So speaking, reading, you know, hearing their voice, following the text, you want a beginner to kind of build those skills. That doesn't mean that a more advanced student, it can't work on things like pronunciation, fluency, the fluidity of their reading, their ability to do things like look up from the page or, um, you know, kind of use a certain intonation. The, the higher level of a speaker they are, the more they'll probably be expected to, you know, to speak and to read things, to read things out loud in a group. Um, so I still think it's useful. Um, I will say that um, you can incorporate silent reading as well. You might even ask your student to read something silently and then um, talk about it. Something I found is sometimes once they get started reading out loud, students keep reading out loud forever, even when a teacher says like, please read to yourself or you know, read this and then we'll talk. You'll still see students like kind of speaking the words as they read. So depending on that, you can kind of incorporate, you know, this one will read out loud, the next one read to yourself because both of those kind of are important skills, if, if that makes sense. Um, we did have a question, this is the last question. Um, again, kind of expressing challenge, um, how to work with lower level students who are difficult to communicate with over remote methods without video. Um, I tried to work with a couple people without computers, found it very tough to use texting, email, or phone calls. What are some secrets to success with this group? Um, well, hopefully after today's presentation, you, you might feel a little more emboldened to try video. Um, but I will say that again, making goals smaller and more manageable might help. So it might not be about having a perfect equivalent in this, in this video format to you know, a tutoring session or a class, but doing things like sending a text successfully back and forth the end, that might be what your student gets a little better at now. Um, you know, kind of a question and an answer that makes sense. Um, because sometimes students who are just getting used to writing and texting, you can't always tell what they're saying, but if the goal is to just do like a Q and A via text, um, then I think that's great. Um, I think there's some ways to use phone calls to supplement video lessons. And Moe, I don't know if you had some experience with that or you've seen tutors using phone calls to kind of add to the video. Yeah, I think, um, I think, well, we have um, in citizenship, we have students who are attending a citizenship class and then we have uh, volunteers who are calling them by phone to ask them the hundred questions, for example, or to practice the application questions with them. Um, but the other thing, and I've been tutoring someone in WhatsApp and um, the text and Eleanor does her whole class in WhatsApp. So she does texting, she does audio, so she'll ask, she'll, you know, she'll text them, how are you? And then she will send an audio, a message that says, how are you today? What is the weather like? And then they will either send an audio that says the weather is sunny or I am fine. Um, so you can do, if you don't want to do the video call, you can do the, the little audio blurb too, which is really fun. Um, and I think Eleanor's class is very a very um, engaged in her teaching and it's not an it's not a video call so if that's something that you choose to do There was a, Moe, you froze. Are you back? I'm back. Okay. Yes, and so that, oh, did everybody hear the last part of that? I don't know if you did. You froze right at the end of how Eleanor's class is going with the video-free methods. Oh. Be successful. I just said that I think she's getting, I think their students are getting a lot out of just the texting and the audio per portion of her class. And there are volunteers who are calling students individually um, outside of class too. So she's got kind of the texting and the audio portion going and also um, volunteers helping with 
conversation over the telephone. So I think you can get a lot out of just the texting and the audio. It, it doesn't have to be video, um, but it's just up to the comfortable, you know, how you and your student are comfortable in it. Yeah, I've had some pretty good text conversations with students who, depending on their mental state right now, their job um, duties, their family involvement, it sometimes feels a little more manageable for them to just like text every now and then. Um, so I've had sort of long form text conversations about what people are doing and how they're practicing English and how they feel about the thing. And, you know, even like talking a little bit about, um, you know, what's in the news and it just, it's sort of a, a way to protract and make a little more leisurely this conversation rather than having it happen in real time in a video call. Um, well, we're almost at the very end. Um, I'm gonna figure out a way now to save the chat text so that we can include that in the materials we send to everybody. Um, if you are a one-on-one -on -one tutor, um, you are free to go at this point. If you are a volunteer in a classroom, Moe just has one more slide about um, what that means and how to be a, a virtual classroom assistant. So if you are taking your leave, um, thank you for attending and we're hope, we hope it's helpful and you will be hearing from us soon with the follow-up documents. So thanks a lot. So as the, whoever is leaving is leaving, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what we have been doing at PAE as far as classroom assistance. Um, so it's definitely a different role um, than you would be if you were in a physical classroom. Um, but basically there are a couple of different ways we're using assistance right now. So um, the first thing was that in the beginning we had teachers um, were helping, the assistants were helping teachers guide students with technology in the online classes. So they were um, either calling them out, outside of class, um, they were helping them online, talking to them about um, how to use the Zoom, how to use the texting function, et cetera. Um, the other way it is um, that we've been using classroom assistance is that they've been working one-on-one -on -one in or in small groups in the breakout rooms. And that's something that we haven't talked about in Zoom, but basically you can form these different rooms in the actual Zoom class. Um, and so a teacher can and a, and a volunteer can be in a room with a student one-on-one. -on -one. And we've used this in citizenship quite a lot. It's great because they can really get a sense of how the student's doing. Um, you know, you can work on spelling, you can work on um, reading, you can have them, you know, give you some conversation. So it's, it's a really great way. So um, it's not something you would have to learn how to do. What the teacher would do is the teacher's in charge of the classroom. They would s set up the breakout rooms and they would just put you in that room with a student or a couple of students and you, and you would have a lesson plan for what to do with those students. And so it would be like being a assistant in a small group when you're in the building. Um, so it's a really great way to use volunteers. So that's one way. Um, and then the other way is just calling students after class um, to practice conversation, so to give them some one-on-one -on -one time. Um, and that's the other way we have been using that. So um, there are basically three ways and it's, they've all been very successful um, since March. We've had a lot of success with using volunteers in the classroom. So if any of you are interested um, in doing that, please let me know. Um, you can send me an email um, and I will be happy to put you on the list for fall of people who are interested in helping with the online classes. Um, let's see, we have any questions about that? I don't think so. I think that concludes the training. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, um, everyone. I really appreciate everybody attending. Um, if you have more questions and you didn't get your question answered, please let us know. We'd be happy to answer them. You can send a text or email um, to me or to Rachel or Nicole. Um, and uh, I hope that you have a wonderful summer. We, we're very happy to see all of you and hope we will see you in the fall at some point. Um, but thank you again for attending and taking the time out for this. Thank you. Thanks, thank guys. You. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you later.